question. You mentioned and you talk in your book uh, that uh, young women, uh, teenage women, are infected by HIV. So my question is: Are parents educated um, in you know HIV risks and how to approach their children, especially young women? And uh, do any international organizations work on that? How to approach their children and how to prevent HIV? Now that's a great question. Um, I think that the, the parents uh, I talked to were pretty similar to, to parents, well, maybe not, some, some parents, in that uh, they didn't want to think that their kids were having sex, uh, and so they didn't want to have the explicit conversation about sex. Um, and so many young women would say, you know, would, would, would say that their parents didn't know or not aware or didn't want to know. So there was a sort of, you know, as I, I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, I think that sort of don't ask, don't tell policy, you know. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, except if you had a rich boyfriend and the boyfriend gave you something that you brought home, right? And so I think one, um, in one case I was here, you know, uh, oh, you know, the, the boyfriend gave you, you know, all these, this nice food to bring home. This is great, we're going to eat well today. It's a sort of an implicit support of a providing boyfriend who's helping to support the household. Um, and so girls would get very strange messages. Where in school they're told, you know, stay away from boys, they'll destroy your life at the same time. Yay, your boyfriend gave us nice stuff. <laughs> and so, you know, but then, you know, if you got pregnant, oh my goodness. Stigma, shame, shaming, being pulled out of school. And so there wasn't really a clear message that girls were getting from parents because parents didn't want to, you know, and even in many cases didn't talk about sex with their kids explicitly, except to not have it. Yeah, I think if they got a message, it was just don't have sex. It will destroy, it will destroy your life. So the same as, 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 as teachers. Um, and so I think it was a real, uh, the, the, the one exception though was um, people who are taking care of orphans, um, the guardians who, you know, the, the few examples I recall where they were like, I sat them down and I explained, boys as well as girls, this is, you know, you need to use a condom if you're going to have sex, and, and rather you don't have sex, etc. But mostly, um, you know, in terms of organizations, I'm, um, I'm not aware of, uh, and even that's not to say that they don't exist. Uh, that's not something I looked into. Um, but I'm sure, I'm sure they exist, but I'm, I'm just not aware. But I think as the general, I know my kid is not having sex. Or oh, I hope they're not having sex because I don't really want to talk to them about sex, especially if it's not hypothetical. Right? It's one thing to do birds and bees when you know, a child is seven, but it's another to say, okay, so I have this boyfriend, and <laughs> which is a different kind of conversation, and it might actually happen. curious whether um, in your work you came across other examples of environments that ever been to a meeting of changing minds or strategies that have impacted specific communities. Mm -hmm. um, no, this was uh, in this setting entirely accidental. Uh, and in fact, when I first started hearing my interviews, people talking about the way it was an icebreaker question. Right? So when you, you know, go into a community or start interviewing people, but you can't lead with, so how many partners did sexual partners did you have in the last 12 months? <laughs> right, it's a kind of, whoa. Right, so you want to ease people in, and so I often would start by saying, so what are some of the major issues in your community? Uh, and they would say, the lake, the lake is polluted. Uh, and so I started there, and at first I thought that this is not relevant, and so slowly guided the information, the interview to issues I thought were relevant. But it kept coming up, lake pollution, lake pollution, and then fishermen also kept coming up. So school girls would say, oh, fishermen are the, are the attractive boyfriends because they always have money, they're rich. You know, it would come up in interviews among middle-aged women, especially those who are widows, fishermen are great partners, in addition to the lake. And so it's when I came away from the field, 
and started putting some of this together, then I realized that the natural environment was actually playing a role in people's risk. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so at the time I was doing my field work. Um, so oh, sorry. So she asked about um, whether the availability of antiretroviral therapy has changed how people view right, people living with HIV and AIDS. So at the time I was doing my field work and it just started to be rolled out for free, and there were really varying responses. Um, so among the HIV positive people I interviewed, obviously. This is amazing, this is wonderful, because the medicine is so expensive. It's like a thousand, you know, a thousand, it was a thousand dollars a month at cost until it came down, you know? And so for many people, it was out of reach until it was made available for free. Um, and so, the, so there was sort of a group of folks, you know, folks who are completely grateful that, oh, this is great, I'm not going to die. It's not a death sentence anymore. Um, and then there was a group of people who were very angry and bitter, because they were like, now we don't know who is positive. And that person would just go around and, and spread the disease. And so I encountered folks who were very angry. They were saying, if you could put a mark on people who are positive, we need to be able to know. And so they felt like with, without the medication, people who had HIV, especially in communities where they felt that you know a few people were the ones who were spreading the disease, like such rumors are often flyer in the community, and, and, and they were really angry. And, and so it was very surprising for me to see such extreme reactions. Um, that the group of sort of grateful to have their lives back and able to live productive lives, and the group who are really angry. I, I should note that uh, there were people who had lost people uh, to HIV AIDS, who were especially angry. Um, yeah, so it was surprising to see those two kinds of reactions. Yes, one of the things I was wondering about is, for the girls and women that do not identify with the gender constructs, are, how are they treated by the social pressure, and does that in any way impact their um, vulnerability towards HIV, AIDS, when get um, less or more so? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, I, 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 would, I would say that my book is very binary in the sense that it's you know, basically men and women and straight men and women in particular. And part of that was I was trying to figure out why young women specifically were, were at risk for HIV. And it, most of that risk seemed to come to heterosexual sex. In terms of how femininities were constructed, there was a really wide variety. Uh, and so I didn't um, and interview any who had unconventional ways of doing gender uh, in the setting. Um, and, and, and so and maybe part of it is um, the self-presentations were so uh, varied in terms of, you know, uh, schools, some schools requiring girls to cut off their hair, so they had very short hair, right? Where in some cultures that would be sort of termed as sort of you know, women who want to do masculinity of some kind, but there was about femininity, all the way through to women who had weaves in their hair or had braids in their hair. And so there are a lot of different kinds, at least, you know, again, just my point of view, more ways of doing femininity that were socially accepted. And so, so maybe that was why. Um, but I didn't encounter any folks who didn't fit within sort of clear gender constructs or the more sort of obvious men, women, gender constru constructs in, in, in my study. And that's not to say that they weren't there. Uh, I just didn't encounter them. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I think the lady in the front. Oh, okay. And you're next back there. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Majala. It was a really lovely talk. Um, I wanted to ask a sort of speculative question. 
Um, the CDC recently issued our report that there's going to be first documented case of Ebola being sexually transmitted. <coughs> and I mean, given that Ebola is a faster, more violent death, um, how do you think that might possibly affect your particular field site and what consequences that might have? Yeah. No, that's a great question. It's, it's interesting um, in making me put on my epi, the epidemiology hat. Well, for one, um, ironically, uh, sexual transmission uh, is a very slow transmission compared to how Ebola has been transmitted, right? So, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I think it's, uh, I haven't you know, studied it as much as the HIV virus, but I think it's spread through bodily fluids, right? And so, if, you know, any sort of saliva or, or um, you know, blood or sort of, you know, vomit or, you know, sort of fluids that come from someone who's, uh, and so there are a lot more fluids than sexual fluids th through which it would transmit. Um, and so that's what one thing is, is, is ironically, I think it's less, uh, uh, Ebola as a sexually transmitted disease is a less, uh, um, less efficient Ebola, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Um, right, I would be scared if it was, you know, more airborne that, that, than, it, than it currently is. Um, and, and, and the other is, um, uh, if someone is living and healthy long enough to sexually transmit Ebola, it's another reason why I think it's a less virulent uh, strain. If, if someone is living that long, then it's not going to be as devastating an Ebola as the current kind of Ebola which kills people in a very short period of time. Um, so, and, and okay, it's a horrible, horrible disease. I mean, Ebola scares me so much, I don't think I can study Ebola. Like, you know, it, within, the world of, uh, within the world of viruses, I have a lot of, you know, respect in a sense for the HIV virus. It's a very smart virus. It's managed to find a way to self-sustain because it can live in a host body for so long and stay invisible for like six years before it starts to actually show up. And so it has developed a really efficient way of moving from person to person. So the thing that scares me about a sexually transmitted Ebola is if it becomes like HIV AIDS because it's a, it's a horrible and quick way to die relative to HIV and AIDS. Um, and so if it's sort of able to stay in someone's system long enough that it can pass on, and that becomes an epidemic, then it's a much more horrible way to die than HIV AIDS. And that's what scares me more than, um, the, but then it's, it's a better version of Ebola than the current version of Ebola. Does that make sense? So, so, I mean, another thing I'll note is that um, AIDS, too, can hide in um, lymph nodes in the lymphatic system. So someone can have HIV and take an HIV test and be undetected. So, yeah, so that's why they often have to do additional lab tests to, to, to confirm. The HIV test itself is a test of antibodies. Um, it's not a test of the HIV virus itself. Um, but HIV can hide. And so there are a lot of places in that viruses can hide. Um, and so it's not surprising to me that Ebola has found a way to, to hide from whatever test they have. Because clearly the, the test must have been a test of something uh, other than, you know, uh, the flu, you know, it didn't test the right <coughs> fluids or the right locations. So they didn't realize perhaps that Ebola could hide in various ways in a person's body. But it's, it's kind of scary. Like, oh no, it's kind of mutated into a version that can last and spread quietly. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I don't even want to mentally go there. <laughs> I'm going to try and forget about it after this presentation. But HIV AIDS is a, is a very smart, it's a smart virus precisely because it's sexually transmitted and it's silent. Um, and so that's why it's, it's persisted for several decades, I think, is, is, is the silence and the hiding and the sexual transmission.